Welcome to Solomon's Bookcase. This episode is the second in our series on the Atonement, the ways in which we understand the significance of Jesus' death. Today we're going to explore the nature of crucifixion, not only in the world that Jesus occupied and lived in, first century CE, but also in the ancient Near Eastern world of the Old Testament. Many of us have been content merely to repeat the words of the New Testament itself as though those words were themselves self-interpreting, as though they were not tied to one of several ways of articulating a narrative context for grasping the meaning of Jesus' death on a Roman cross. This is a quote from Mark Baker and Joel Green. These are two biblical scholars who have written extensively on the topic of atonement, helping us to grasp the need of graduating beyond simplistic, naive readings of our New Testament. The words don't just interpret themselves off the page, as Baker and Green say, but rather they present themselves upon the pages of our Bibles as a gift, and this is a gift to be enjoyed through responsible interpretation. Well, that's exactly what we will continue to do on today's episode. The crucifixion of Jesus took place during the Passover festivals in Jerusalem. We don't have an exact date, but some scholarship, both biblical as well as astronomical, has placed the event at either the year 30 or 33 CE, sometime in early April. Now, if that seems awfully precise to date an event that happened over 2,000 years ago, I understand and completely honor your skepticism. And for this reason, I would encourage you to check out the show notes for an excellent article by um, one Aaron Wall. And Aaron dives deep into the ancient sources surrounding the dating of the crucifixion event. So take a look there on the website. Now, at or around the moment of Jesus' death, three of the gospel writers indicate that darkness and earthquakes accompany his final breath. Here's a portion of what Mark tells us in the Gospel of Mark, and I'll read that for you now. And it was the third hour, 9 a.m., when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge read against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, one on his right and one on his left. And when the sixth hour had come, noon, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, 3 p.m. The Gospel of Matthew, and Matthew, who many scholars believe is writing sometime after Mark, adds this detail. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And look now, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Matthew goes on to say that this supernatural earthquake opened the tombs of the faithful, and these formerly dead found their way into Jerusalem during the religious festival. And if you're picturing the zombie apocalypse, um, You're not that far off. We have no description of what this looked like. But yeah, the formerly dead are are wandering into Jerusalem and they start interacting with people. Matthew, for some reason, doesn't tell us any of the details about this. What condition were these men and women in as they're walking into the city? Or, I mean, what would your opening conversation starter be as a recently dead but upstanding member of the community? I mean, how do you not go into any detail about this? That's what Matthew tells us. The 8th century BCE prophet Amos is often quoted as having prophesied about this noontime darkness over the land during Christ's last moments. Although in Amos' day, 700 years before, See, Amos was prophesying against something else. He was prophesying against the people of Israel who were abusing the poor and looking out for their financial profiteering and interests and placing that above their reverence for God and their poorer neighbors. So here's what Amos says in this regard. But of course, look for the parallels with the crucifixion account. 
The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account, and every one mourn who dwells in it, and all of it rise like the Nile, and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt? And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Now we'll talk about the prophetic voice in a future episode of the Creed of the Percipients. But what we're seeing here is a common feature of the prophetic, an immediate application of the prophet's message as it's being proclaimed in the 8th century BCE, but with echoes of fulfillment which ripple down the historical timeline all the way to the first century. See, many people during Amos's day thought of the day of the Lord as this festive, happy occasion where God showers his people with favor, regardless of you know, how they might be conducting themselves in their day-to-day life. But Amos counters this, this, this expectation. Here's what Amos says. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord, What is the day of the Lord to you? It's darkness, not light. Now, seven centuries later, then, as Jesus hangs suspended in the air, a target of humiliation, darkness falls over the scene. I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. See, the day of the Lord is here. Salvation has come. But the day of the Lord is ushered in under the darkness of day. And as the transition is marked from the noontime darkness to the afternoon sun, the curtain in the temple, which has huge theological significance, tears itself in half from top to bottom. The earth shakes, rocks that have been undisturbed in place for millennia split in two, and the dead begin rising from the grave. And of course, this calls for the relevant audio clip from Ghostbusters to be played, because maybe you weren't thinking about it, but I couldn't help but to. Hey, Ray. Do you remember something in the Bible about the last days when the dead would rise from the grave? I remember Revelation 7:12. And I looked as he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became as black as sackcloth, and the moon became as blood. The seas boiled and the skies fell. Judgment Day. Judgment Day. Every ancient religion has its own myth about the end of the world. Myth? Ray, has it ever occurred to you that maybe the reason we've been so busy lately is because the dead have been rising from the grave? How about a little music? Yeah. Now, what Dan Aykroyd's character, Ray, is quoting here is actually Revelation 6.12, although slightly mangled. Here's what the actual text says. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and here there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth. The moon became like blood. The stars fell to the earth. We skip to verse 17. For the great day of wrath has come, and who can stand before it? So again, the day of the Lord has come, but a darkness, spiritual, raw, terrifying, precedes the victorious celebrations. Amos, the Gospels, now Revelation, echo this. It's probably a good time to mention that we're going to have a whole series of episodes down the line on eschatology. Heaven, hell, and the afterlife. Can't promise when that will fall in the order of our topics that we'll eventually cover, but it's unquestionably on the list. There is some excellent work which has been done on the possible event that was transpiring during this April crucifixion. The question that is asked continually, was this darkness a metaphor, or was it literally darkness? The most obvious culprit being like a a solar eclipse, right? Did this really happen? Or is it a metaphor for something that's happening? Now, I won't attempt to replicate that research or the arguments for and against here because I'm not 
as concerned with how literal this darkness needs to be taken. Again, if, if this is of interest to you, I can't recommend enough Aaron Wall's article, which I've already referenced here and is in the show notes. The most interesting quotation from the early church seems to center around a historian. Some would say a historian with a bit of a dubious reputation, but a historian nonetheless, is kind of like a tabloid historian, um, named Philagian of Tralles, who wrote in the second century CE. Now, despite his reputation, he is widely quoted by St. Africanus, Origen, Eusebius, and other church fathers. Philagian mentions the darkness and the earthquake, and it's at least possible that he's relying on primary sources, independent of the biblical tradition, which would give this quite a bit of credibility. In other words, he, he claims to be relying upon independent Roman sources that might corroborate this miraculous event. So what I'm going to read for you now is a quotation from Eusebius's Chronicle, written around 380 CE, and it appears to contain a quotation from Philagian. And this is all quoted in turn by Jerome, who's writing much later. So here's what Eusebius says. Jesus Christ, according to the prophecies which had been foretold about him beforehand, came to his passion in the 18th year of Tiberius, at which time also we find these things written verbatim in other commentaries of the Gentiles, that an eclipse of the sun happened, Bithynia was shaken by an earthquake, and the city of Nicaea, many buildings collapsed, of which agree of what occurred in the passion of the Savior. Indeed, Philagian, who's an excellent calculator of Olympiads, also writes about these things, writing this in his 13th book. And now Eusebius is going to quote Philagian. In the fourth year, however, of Olympiad 202, 32 to 33 CE, an eclipse of the sun happened, greater and more excellent than any that had happened before it. At the sixth hour, day turned into dark night, so that the stars were seen in the sky, and an earthquake in Bithynia toppled many buildings of the city of Nicaea. It should be noted that astronomically, we are able to trace possible eclipses back in time to this period. And unfortunately, there isn't much of a likelihood that a natural eclipse of the sun would have taken place. The movements of the sun and moon just don't line up. As seen by the Philagian quotation, however, there remains some possibility that the unusual darkness and powerful earthquakes were captured and recorded by observers at the time who had no idea who Jesus was or what was happening to him at that moment. After all, Bithynia is hundreds of miles from Jerusalem. But what the gospel writers seem intent on doing is tying the atmosphere, the mood, the supernatural atmosphere of the crucifixion of Jesus to the day of the Lord in Amos, which will later be replicated again in the image of judgment and reconciliation in Revelation. Darkness, earthquakes, followed by resurrection. The day of the Lord is here, but who can endure its coming? The crucifixion of Jesus is fulfilled under the darkness of judgment, the darkness of the evil of men and women, and the need for reconciliation. But this act of evil is completed under the light of day. What was accomplished by this man Jesus dying, such that nature itself is said to convulse and darken? What I'd like to do is dive into three questions concerning Jesus and the cross. My hope, of course, is that you find these questions to be provocative, that they, uh, I, know, I realize they may or may not be particularly new questions for you, and that's okay either way, but I maintain, and I'm going to maintain that they're important to discuss as we grapple some more with the significance of Jesus's crucifixion, how it relates to his saving work. I think mean, that's what this whole series is about. So we'll spend most of today's episode addressing these questions as we illumine the realities of the crucifixion event. So here they are. Question one, how rare or common was it for someone to be crucified in Jerusalem or in the larger Roman Empire in which Jesus and his people lived? So was this something that Jesus and maybe only a few other people 
would have experienced, or was it common, even very common? And crucifixion, as horrendous a death as it was, was just a part of the world that Jesus and his disciples inhabited. Okay, question two. The Christian traditions have always emphasized the sufferings of Jesus on the cross. But, but which sufferings are we really referring to here? You know, is it the physical sufferings, the, the physical symptoms of being hung on the wood, asphyxiating, exposed to the elements, that sort of thing? Or are we perhaps more concerned with the spiritual suffering of assuming upon himself the burden or weight of humanity's moral shortcomings? You know, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, arrest, his fake trial, his torture, crucifixion, is often referred to as the Passion. And you might remember several years ago, Mel, Gri Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ. Okay, that's, the Passion is actually a, a theological term, and that's what we're referring to there, is that whole series of events leading up to the cross. So we, when we refer to the sufferings of Christ throughout the Passion, how do we contextualize the physical sufferings of Jesus with what he is suffering spiritually? Okay, question three. Did Jesus have to be crucified? I mean, why not eaten by an animal or stabbed or pushed off a cliff? Or for that matter, killed by Herod as a baby, since we know Herod sent assassins to do just this, as recorded in Matthew. You know, as Matthew tells us that infant boys under two years old in the vicinity of Bethlehem were slaughtered out of fear of who Jesus might become. So does the particular manner of Jesus' death lend a significance to the spiritual significance of his sacrifice? I mean, if all it is is that Jesus had to die, you know, for his atoning work to be completed, why crucifixion? And why wait until he's an adult? Okay, so three questions, and I'll be sure to remind you of the context of each question as we address them. Okay. Let's concern ourselves with that first question. How common were crucifixions at this time and in this place? Well, as it turns out, crucifixion had a long, sordid history of practice in many societies predating the life of Jesus. And you probably maybe foresaw that by the question, the way I asked the question. Crucifixions are, look, crucifixions are terrible enough that we would probably just assume, knowing what we know about the Roman Empire in the first century, we would just assume that these guys came up with this little crime against humanity. Um, that is totally something we would expect from them. But not so. Someone invented this terrible idea way before the Romans were any kind of political power. You know, we have records of the Assyrians. These are the people who conquered the northern kingdom of Israel in 701 BCE, uh, impaling their criminals as well as prisoners of war, and doing actually far, far worse to them than that. The ancient Assyrians were known for their affinity of torture, uh, generally among some of the worst war criminals the ancient Near Eastern world could give us. After taking one particular city in battle, the Assyrian king Tiglath Pileser III said this, Naba Ushashabi, their king, I hung up in front of the gate of his city on a stake. His land, his wife, his sons, his daughters, his property, the treasure of his palace, I carried it off. The Assyrian propaganda after these battles makes it clear that the more gruesome and ruthless the battle and your treatment of the people in its aftermath, the more war crimes you can commit and celebrate over your vanquished enemy, hey, that's better. You know, these are the same people, and in part the same king, Tiglath Pileser III, who will conquer the northern kingdom of Israel and carry away many of its residents into permanent exile. Now, he was by no means the only Assyrian ruler impaling his enemies on stakes. Here's what the ruler Ashurnasapal II tells us after his victory. I captured soldiers alive and erected them on stakes in front of their conquered cities. And we could then speak of the Achaemenid Persians. These are the people who figure in the exilic books of the Bible like Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. And we know that the Achaemenid Persians practiced some form of crucifixion, as the Persian ruler Darius I had something like 3,000 of his political opponents crucified in Babylon, as Herodotus tells us. If you're familiar with the story of the 
the 300 Spartans at uh, Thermopylae. And you're, you're familiar with the Spartan king, Leonidas, who dies defending the pass of the hot gates. The Persian king Xerxes, again according to Herodotus, then impales Leonidas' corpse as revenge for the humiliation of that battle. And here's what he says. Here's what Herodotus says regarding that battle. Having spoken in this way, Xerxes passed over the place where the dead lay, and hearing that Leonidas had been king and general of the Lacedaemonians, he gave orders to cut off his head and impale it. It is plain to me by this piece of evidence, among many others, that while Leonidas lived, King Xerxes was more incensed against him than against all others. Otherwise, he would never have dealt so outrageously with his dead body, for the Persians are beyond all men known in the habit of honoring valiant warriors. And just a little while later, we'll have Alexander the Great in 322 BCE, who conquers the city of Tyre, which is on the coast of modern-day Lebanon. The city of Tyre held out for seven months against Alexander and his army until the siege was broken. And as the accounts go, Alexander was so furious. You're noticing a pattern here with rulers being furious that they have to fight people who they feel are beneath them. But Alexander was so furious that the city had frustrated his hopes of a quick victory that he sold 30,000 of the residents, men, women, and children, into slavery once he captured the city. According to the later sources, Roman, uh, one in particular, Roman senator Quintus Curtius Rufus, this is what he said. The extent of the bloodshed can be judged from the fact that 6,000 fighting men were slaughtered within the city's fortifications. It was a sad spectacle that the furious king Alexander then provided for the victors. 2,000 Tyrians who had survived the rage of the tiring Macedonians now hung nailed to crosses all along the huge expanse of the beach. Now more specific to the time of Jesus and the Roman Empire, People were crucified. But to drill down into that a little bit, there were actually many different methods of crucifixion. Now we have the mental image, most of us, the, the T, the vertical post, and the cross beam to which the victim would be fastened by nails or a rope. By the first century, there still seems to be actually a variety of crucifixion methods, and not all of them would look the way that we imagine with that crossbar. Uh, Seneca who was a philosopher, statesman, contemporary with the time of Jesus, though Seneca almost certainly would have had no knowledge of Jesus. Uh, but he wrote this observation upon seeing a crucifixion site. He says this, I see crosses there, not just of one kind, but made in many different ways. Some have their victims with head down to the ground. Some impale the private parts. Others stretch out their arms along the gallows. So according to Seneca, some people are crucified upside down, some right side up, fastened by different parts of their body. Yeah, and this seems to correlate with other Roman sources on the variety of crucifixion methods. Okay, let's not belabor that point anymore. A Swedish biblical scholar named Gunnar Samuelsson has recently put forward a thesis that our standard idea of what a crucifixion looked like may be too presumptuous. Samuelson studies the terminology of crucifixion from the Old Testament as well as extra-biblical sources, and he concludes that the exact appearance of a crucifixion like Jesus's cannot be definite. You know, was it a post and a cross beam? Was it something else? But at most, according to Samuelson, we can say that what happened to Jesus is this. He was a man suspended above the ground for the ultimate purpose of execution. He would have been attached uh, to the staros, that's the post, after having carried that instrument to his execution grounds, and he would have been fastened to it. A sign would have been posted, indicating the nature of the crime. And, and that's what we can know. And that's, of course, exactly what happened to Jesus. We know that, suspended above the ground for the purpose of execution by the state, attached to the post after carrying the beam, to the crucifixion site, um, though we know he was too weakened physically to complete this task, so a volunteer had to be found to carry it the rest of the way. And a sign was placed above his head in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, 
the king of the Jews. We further know that uh, the Romans were quite picky about who, uh, who was or who was not to be crucified. The Roman poet Juvenal, and he's writing from the end of the first century CE, Juvenal substantiates the notion that crucifixion for slaves was very common, and owners of slaves could choose to crucify a slave for really no reason at all. To illustrate just how normal this practice was, Juvenal made sure to record for us a fight between a husband and a wife. And in, and in this recording, the wife wants to crucify one of the household slaves. But the husband starts you know, throwing all these objections at her. Well, you know, what crime did he commit? Where are the witnesses against him? Why not let him defend himself? To which the wife responds, Do you consider a slave to be the same as a man? You know, essentially, my word is enough. Crucify him. Why are you arguing about this? It's just a slave. So we have this domestic squabble um, that might be funny or humorous if it was about something other than the torture and death of a person, one of the slaves. Um, it, it demonstrates a very relaxed attitude towards slavery, which is one of the reasons why Juvenal records it for us. Slaves, enemies of the state, traitors, prisoners of war, these could all be crucified apparently without too much scandal in the Roman world. So slaves are on the low end of the privileged spectrum of Roman life. Uh, Roman citizens, of course, are on the opposite end, the high end of that particular privileged spectrum. Now, a Roman citizen decidedly could not be crucified for anything unless it was a particularly egregious crime like treason against the state. Uh, in fact, we learned from several Roman sources at the time, the great orator uh, Cicero among them, that crucifixion really isn't <laughs> this isn't a topic for polite conversation among the middle and upper classes or the uh, you know the more cultured among us. Um, everyone knows what's going on. You know, you walk out to the main road, the public square, and yeah, of course you're going to see crucified criminals lining the road. But it's not the kind of thing you bring up at the wine and cheese social, whatever the Roman equivalent to that might have been. I think it might have actually been a wine and cheese social. Crucifixion, a uh, real awkward conversation killer there. Uh, this is something that happens to other people, not our kind, right? Well, the conclusion must be that some form of impaling your enemy or crucifying your enemy has been around a very long time. I mean, I, I hope that you've gathered that by this point of our discussion, right? A lot of people through history unbelievably have been through a crucifixion. Um, before Jesus' time, as well as after. So, Okay, um, that being said, go find a puppy or a kitten and some hot cocoa and go comfort yourself during this interlude. I feel like that segment got a little dark. Here's some music as you pet your pet. Everybody back? Feeling better? Let's hope so, because we're not really done. The second question, after all, has to do with Jesus' sufferings. I know, just hang with me. Who knew that uh, when we set out to talk about crucifixion, it might be a downer of a conversation, right? If you remember, our second question that we are going to deal with is this. When we talk about the sufferings of Jesus, how... Are the physical sufferings interacting with the spiritual sufferings? Okay, so to address this question, we first need to understand something more about the political nature of the world that Jesus inhabited. So, why was it legal for Jesus to be put to death? For, I mean, think about from a Roman perspective, from a government perspective, what was his crime? If you had to convict him for something in a legal framework, what would it even be? 
So why is it legal for Jesus to be put to be put to death in the Roman sense? For essentially what? Being a a traveling preacher with a healing ministry? I mean, okay, well, the entire area that we now think of as Israel was in the first century CE under Roman governorship. I'm sure that you've gathered that. Um, it, it behaved very much like a colony, a very distant colony governed by Rome. So under Roman law, only the state has the authority to crucify someone. In other words, under occupation, the Jewish religious and political rulership in Jerusalem, they can't just sentence someone like Jesus to death on their own. That's why we see these Jewish authorities in the Gospels going to a man, petitioning this man named Pontius Pilate. Now, Pilate, who is mentioned in the Gospels as giving the authority to have Jesus crucified, is a prefect serving under the Roman emperor Tiberius. So prefect is a certain level, certain title of governorship under the jurisdiction of the, of the Roman emperor, in this case, Tiberius. And Pilate is a fascinating character in his own right. His appointment over the province of Syria, of which Judea was a part, shows us the Romans didn't consider this area to be particularly of high importance. And governing this area, in fact, is not exactly a prestigious assignment. Uh, it comes with some significant downsides, foremost being the constant uprisings and discontent among the Jewish religious political leadership. The Roman historian Philo, as well as the Jewish historian Josephus, uh, both describe Pilate for us, and the descriptions are, shall we say, mixed at best. Philo, in fact, relates these characteristics of Pilate. His corruption and his acts of insolence and his rapine and his habit of insulting people and his cruelty and his continual murders of people, untried and uncondemned, and his never-ending and gratuitous and most grievous inhumanity which is really an interesting description, isn't it? When we, when we look at the Gospels, because Pilate isn't particularly cruel at all in the Gospel accounts, nor is he eager to crucify Jesus. Um, in fact, he seems quite the opposite. We're meant to sense his extreme hesitancy to have Jesus killed. All four Gospels convey this hesitancy. He, he seems to almost continually be looking for ways to release Jesus. But at least according to the gospel accounts, you know, Pilate eventually allows Jesus to be crucified. Why? Well, it looks like primarily to appease the Jewish leadership that, of course, wants him dead. Pilate isn't looking for another reason for instability in his province. So he caves to the demands of the, the, the religious leadership um, of the Jewish people in order to appease them. If you're familiar with Pilate's reputation and history after Jesus, we know that this strategy doesn't work for him. And uh, Pilate will end up being recalled to Rome in 37 CE after he harshly puts down a revolt by the Jewish Samaritans. And early church tradition claims that the new Roman emperor Caligula orders Pilate to commit an honor suicide in the year 39 CE due to his failures. Josephus actually says that Pilate died on the way to Rome as he's being recalled, um, though the circumstances may well have been suspicious. If you were a government official and fell on the wrong side of the emperor's favor, it's amazing how easily accidents could happen to you while you're on your horse. Crucifixion, as mentioned above, wasn't always performed the same way. And even within the Roman Empire, uh, the conventions differed. But regardless of the exact method, the purpose of crucifying someone wasn't just to make them physically suffer before death. 
I mean, we can't negate the extreme physical pain that came with being crucified. One could speak of the dehydration, the continual exposure to the heat, cold, sun, and rain, the hunger, the immense pressure on your limbs, and of course the pain itself um, from, the, from the, the nails or whatever it is that's holding you to that post. And we could go on and on about the horrendous nature of this kind of death. But this particular type of punishment was primarily meant to humiliate. See, you would first be tortured by flogging, then forced to carry your own elements of execution to the spot, which was almost always in a very public space, such as lining a, a busy road or near a public gathering spot. You see, the crucifixion event, the spectacle of it, it's a display of strength and this sort of ultimate authority and power that you as the Roman government have over the individual. It's sending this message to everyone that happens by. Look what happens to thieves. Look what happens to disobedient slaves. Look what happens to those that oppose us. So your last moments on earth are filled, yes, with physical suffering, but also the humiliation and shame directed at you, directed at your family, directed at anyone associating with you who might sympathize with who you were and what you stood for. Some prominent Romans of this era believed that public crucifixion would serve as an effective deterrent for crime. Not only a deterrent, but the Emperor Justinian also thought that it would be a comfort to the victim of a crime or the family of a murdered citizen, to be able to walk down to the scene of the crime and be able to pass by that very criminal responsible, and they're hanging there, suffering. And you could go down and you could see this. Roman citizens were generally immune from crucifixion, but violent criminals, disobedient slaves, thieves, foreigners that spoke or acted against the agenda of the Roman government were most definitely fair game. To close the circle on this cycle of humiliation, as one final insult, you probably could not expect to be buried once you finally passed away. Instead, your body would be left exposed. Animals would be allowed to come and eat away your remains. So, if you recall in the scriptures, when a man named Joseph of Arimathea asked to be able to take Jesus' body after it's taken off the crucifixion post. The scriptures say that he boldly asks. He asks for Jesus' body. Well, why is that action bold? Well, because he's asking, essentially, to violate the tradition of humiliation that is common for a crucified criminal to endure. He's asking to honor the body of a condemned man, to bury the body in a respectful fashion rather than letting the animals come and further humiliate and degrade the carcass. Certainly the Pharisees, who were the most opposed to Jesus' ministry, would not look favorably upon a man who denied Jesus the final humiliations of having birds and animals take bites out of his body as he lay exposed, right? So Joseph of Arimathea boldly asks for the body of Jesus to take it down from the post and honor it with a proper burial. Okay, so it was incredibly common in the world that Jesus grew up in and interfaced with. Crucified men and women hanging on some version of a cross or stake as what? As a visible reminder of whose authority you lived under and what they could do to you if you challenged or disagreed with that authority. And I, I, I do hope that you're, you don't feel we're dwelling gratuitously on this topic, um, because just by reading you the accounts of ancient historians like Josephus, well, our modern sensibilities for most of us would be shocked at the level of cruelty and maliciousness that surrounds this form of torture and death. And, but for them, it was incredibly common to see. It's ultimately a display of power. Let me read one of the less gruesome accounts by Josephus, which is still really disturbing if you can picture what's actually happening here. This is an account of the Jewish revolt in Jerusalem 
which the Roman general Titus, who will later be the emperor Titus, um, Titus is sent to deal with this uprising. And this revolt will end up in the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in the year 70 CE, the dispersal of a large chunk of the Jewish population. But listen to Josephus' description here, and note especially how crucifixion is being used as a demonstration of Roman power over the Jews, and how Titus even attempts to use the crucifixions as a tool of intimidation to get this revolt to end. Here's what Josephus records. When the Jews were going to be taken by the Romans, they were forced to defend themselves, and after they had fought, they thought it too late to make any supplications for mercy. So they were first whipped and then tormented with all sorts of tortures before they died and were then crucified before the wall of the city. Titus, the Roman general, felt pity for them. But as their number, given as up to 500 per day, was too great for him to risk either letting them go or putting them under guard, he allowed his soldiers to have their way especially as he hoped that the gruesome sight of the countless crosses might move the besieged to surrender. So the soldiers, out of the rage and hatred they bore these prisoners, nailed those they caught in different postures to the crosses by way of jest, and their number was so great that there was not enough room for the crosses and not enough crosses for the bodies. So we see here not just the propaganda value of these crucifixions, but also the free license for additional cruelty that could be given to the soldiers to sort of act out their frustrations and their prejudices on these Jewish soldiers. Titus sees that letting these soldiers do these things to their prisoners is like a relief valve, and he takes advantage of it. We've established that if you're witnessing the crucifixion of Jesus as an uninvolved civilian, his physical sufferings are pretty much in line with what any crucified slave, political opponent, or thief would endure. This is really where we've been heading this entire episode. The uniqueness of the atonement cannot be that Jesus died as a result of a crucifixion. That reasoning simply doesn't work. The key, rather, is who Jesus is. His identity as part of this Godhead. The key is his mission. To borrow from Martin Hengel, Jesus, despite his identity, is willing to identify himself with the extremes of human wretchedness, the existence of a slave, the disgrace of a traitor and a thief. The crucifixion is unique because it demonstrates the solidarity of the love of God with those who suffer, who experience unspeakable shame. In the words of the prophet Isaiah, it's the moment when Jesus is the most unattractive. Nothing to make him appealing to us, yet it was for our atonement that he exposes himself to the death of a nobody. The day of the Lord begins with deep shame and darkness and guilt. It's not that these sufferings outweigh one another, but rather that they complement one another. He endures the physical torture because it exposes him in complete human vulnerability to the world that mankind can inflict upon itself and the worst disgrace that one could fear to experience in this life. He endures the spiritual torture and abandonment as only the divine Messiah could, and as no human could ever hope to. As Matthew 26 records the experience of Jesus the night of his anguish, he became anguished and distressed, and he said to them, Peter, James, and John, my soul is deeply grieved, even to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me.
Which leads us to our third and final question, and also by far the briefest. Why crucifixion? Why not kill Jesus off in this story as a baby, or in a thousand other ways? Well, here's at least one answer. Because of the shame. The atonement somehow only works when it is as a result of a willing choice which Jesus makes. Not only to die, but to die in this uniquely shameful and thoroughly disgraceful way. Again, to quote Hengel, crucifixion was a crime deterrent in the Roman world, but also satiated a primitive lust for revenge and cruelty. Here's what Hengel says. It is a manifestation of transubjective evil, a form of execution which manifests the demonic character of human cruelty and bestiality. The atonement only works when Jesus voluntarily subjects himself, defenseless, to this demonic character of human cruelty. So we see that the Roman government, Roman society, has its reasons for crucifying someone. The Jewish religious leadership at the time that Jesus lived and died has its own reasons to crucify In this particular case, they want to make an example of Jesus for very carnal reasons. They feel threatened by him, by his following, by his teaching. He's a problem that needs to go away. So they metaphorically, or perhaps literally, make a deal with the devil. If you're a part of that religious leadership, Do you still stand by that deal you made when the ground beneath you begins to shake and darkness overtakes the sun and ancient prophecies about the day of the Lord hang thick in the air?